Hello, folks. Welcome to the Genuinely Interested Podcast. Hope everyone is staying healthy, staying safe, staying home. Today on the podcast, I have Mark Beckoff. Mark is a professor of ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of Boulder, Colorado. He is also the co-founder, along with Jane Goodall, of Ethologist for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. He's won many awards for his scientific research, including the Exemplar Award for Animal Behavior Society and the Guggenheim Fellowship. He's also published numerous essays and books, and he's just a very knowledgeable person when it comes to animal behavior and uh, psychology. So me and Mark talked about animals. We talked about everything animal related, their lives, their inner worlds, their uh, cognitive abilities, sentience, a lot of things that people maybe don't either know or realize or interact or think about daily, but there's a rich world, emotional world that most, if not all animals have, that we're just not in tune to. And Mark has been studying this field for many, many years. He uh, is very knowledgeable and uh, it was just interesting to get his take about it. I recently read his book, The Emotional Lives of Animals, and I thought it was fascinating. So I wanted to have him on the show, talk to him about it. Animals is something that I've always really been interested in. And when you get a chance to talk to someone like Mark, who's so knowledgeable and has been studying animals in their natural habitats for many, many years, and is a bit of an outlier as far as ethologists go. He's been known to do things differently, which is something that I appreciate. And I think a lot of people appreciate it as well. He's worked with Jane Goodall. That name speaks for itself. So uh, yeah, without further ado, here's Mark Beckoff. Hey, Going. Mark, how you doing? I'm fine, thanks. How are you? Good. Thanks for uh, coming on the podcast. I'm um, happy to have you on to discuss everything animals. <laughs> okay. And we <laughs> shall try to do everything animals. How are you doing over there in Boulder? Everything's fine in, Col- in, in Boulder. I mean, you know, there's a lot of cases here, but we're affected. You know, I'm, we're all interconnected and stuff like that. So it's nothing like New York City or you know, other areas, but, you know, we've got a great governor and we've been under, you know, some people call it house arrest, but since I've always worked at home, it's fine. But, but people are pretty good about minding, you know, what they're supposed to do. So, and a lot of animals are coming into the streets who occasionally come, but the streets are pretty empty. Boulder's really a pretty small town. And so we've got some mountain lions and more deer and, foxes running through the streets, which I think is just lovely. I've seen videos and pictures of animals across the world just venturing out from, you know, the mountains or the rivers or the wherever it is. And they're just going into new areas that they probably haven't visited in 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Yep. Well, they're taking over their homes that we stole from them. Yeah, definitely. Can you tell us a little bit, you know, about who you are and your work a little bit? I'm a field biologist, an ethologist, people call us, because we do field work on animal behavior, um, behavioral ecology. And I've been really interested in the field called cognitive ethology, which is a study of animal minds. So a lot of my research has been on the cognitive, emotional, and moral lives of animals. And um, I taught at the University of Colorado for decades. And I left about 14 years ago, just to be on my own. I loved my job, but I just was ready to kind of move on. And I still do research, and I've been writing a lot of books and articles. And I ride my bike, give or take 300 or so kilometers a week. (laughs) 300 kilometers a week. Yeah. We we try to get in 200 miles a week, give or take. So, So that's basically what I do. Is that just in Boulder? Well, the way Boulder is situated... Within, you know, almost no time, you could head west and you're going uphill, or you can head south, north, and east, and you're going pretty flat or rollers. So, yeah, there's we ride a lot of gravel out here, too, dirt on dirt. So um, there's no shortage of riding opportunities. Pretty good. That's, I mean, I, I try to get, like, even 10 miles of, of just running a week. Yeah. It's just it's impossible. to. We just don't, don't have the, the space here, I think. 
obviously as 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 you guys have in Colorado. Yeah, there's a lot of opportunity out here. Can you tell us a little bit about the the new book that you are writing with uh, Jessica Pierce? I'd love to hear more about it. We're writing a book on what the world will be like for dogs as and when humans disappear. And unfortunately, it's timely. But, you know, if we followed any responsible politicians or anybody who really knew what was going on or knew what was going on and and faced it, you know, um, pandemics like this have been predicted for years. So there's no surprise there. And they're tragic, of course. But we've been thinking about this idea for a really long time, because writing about what the world will be like for dogs without humans really reflects a lot on who dogs are now and the nature of the relationship they have with humans. So, you know, there's homed dogs with whom most people are familiar. And then there's free ranging and feral dogs. And turns out that of the billion or so dogs in the world, you know, give or take 75 to 85% are on, pretty much on their own. People don't know that. So most of what we read about dogs or the dog, and there really is no the dog because there's so much variation, deals with homed Western dogs. So the bottom line when we consider just a lot of different topics is that many dogs will do very well without us and they'll ultimately become part of the wildlife fauna. So they'll revert back to what they were essentially, at least some of the breeds? Well, it's a good question. We call it reverse engineering. You know, they're not going to de-domesticate because you you can't. Domestication is a process that basically includes an entire species. So you have domesticated dogs who became dogs from wolves. They'll feralize, if you will. And and it's really it's you know, it's not really clear who they'll become. It'll depend on where they live, their interactions with dogs and other animals, food supply. I mean, the ecology of who dogs will come is really going to be very similar to who wild animals are, especially their wild relatives like wolves and coyotes and foxes, for example. So it's not necessarily the case that big dogs will survive, no small dogs or dark dogs or light dogs, it's going to depend on where they live and who they have to interact with because they're going to be on their own. That's the bottom line. So how how do you see uh, this specific pandemic? How do you see that affecting pets and, uh, and wildlife? In terms of wildlife, it's hard to know. I mean, like here in Boulder, we will, you know, some regularity have black bears and mountain lions or cougars and foxes and deer, you know, in the streets especially in the foothills to the West, but across the world. I mean, there's articles all over in the BBC, in the New York Times and other places, you know, basically saying, you know, that wildlife is, you know, once again, coming back into their homes. So they're going to come back because most wild animals try to avoid us unless they've been fed or, you know, can avoid us. So. You know, I, the pandemic is horrific, so I never would want to think there's there's not a positive side to it. I mean, literally. But, you know, from the wild animals point of view, it's really working well. For companion animals, it's a mixed bag. A lot are being, you know, brought back to shelters and surrendered because people can't take care of them. There's a lot of myths out there about the way in which um, the coronavirus is transmitted or catchable. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Some people are saying, oh, that dogs and cats can, can serve as hosts and pass the coronavirus. But that's that's bullshit. There's no truth to that, right? Potentially, they might get, you know, something on their skin and they could basically flake it off. But I wouldn't consider them to be major hosts of the virus. And, you know, in fact, you know, the best the best recommendation that you can give to people is that, you know, if you're living with a dog, it's like living with another person, you know, I mean, in the same environment, but don't pet a strange dog, for example, because we don't know enough about it. And so I would rather err on the side of caution. And then there's a bunch of articles over the last couple of days on cats 
you know, saying that they can they can contract it, they could get it from humans. So but whether they pay, got it. yeah, the tiger at the Bronx Zoo, for example, obviously got it from a human. But I think we're seeing fewer surrenders as people come to um, understand this. But but also, you know, it's a financial burden. People feel they can't give their animal the life that they want. I mean, they're stuck at home and they can't walk them. They don't understand what they need. And to be honest, you know, some of them just say, look, it's just one more burden that I just can't deal with. So the upside, apparently, is that there's been a, a lot more adoptions and apparently some shelters and humane societies are running out of animals to foster or to rescue. So that's the upside, if you will. But and people, are, so, you know, some people, people are spending more time with their pets. Yeah, it's, but it's it's kind of a vicious cycle. On the one hand, you have people who are fostering and adopting these dogs. And on the other hand, you have people who, for for some reason, be it because they lost a job and they can't take care of the dog or whatever the reason, they're bringing these dogs back to shelters. So it's almost they almost like balance each other out. I wonder which one the numbers are greater. It's hard to know. I mean, I think what you're pointing out is a really good sort of um, it's it's a good point you're making. You know, it's hard to keep or find really great records because everybody is so tied up with the disaster of the pandemic. But I think a lot of people would be very happy if, in fact, it was like a wash that, you know, at some point it would be same number in is the same number out. You mentioned tigers before. I can't, you know, uh, right now, if anyone is mentioning tigers, they're mentioning Tiger King. Did you happen to watch that crazy documentary? No. You know, I've been asked to do a lot of interviews and I decided I'm not going to watch it. It's it's very contentious. I know there's more than two sides, it seems, to what's yeah. going on. Yeah. And, you know, the general message of getting rid of roadside zoos and stuff like that, places like that, I, I'm all for. But I, I haven't followed the nitty gritty. And part of the reason, of course, is because I'm writing a book and I need the time to write. The other is there's always going to be, you know, if you have, if you have 10 people, you're going to get 11 opinions. <laughs> and I, and I don't really, it's like I said, the major message of getting rid of bad roadside zoos and getting rid of bad sanctuaries, nobody's going to really debate that. But I, I can't say any more about the Tiger King. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's crazy how much of a social and cultural phenomenon uh, it just kind of blew up, it's, you know, from memes and then just all over the internet. And unfortunately, I think they kind of missed the um, missed the mark on that one because originally I think it was supposed to be kind of a blackfish for for the cats, for big cats. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And instead of being that, it became this salacious kind of documentary almost like a reality tv tv s type show and oh i did okay it, it kind of missed the mark it wasn't it, it it focused more on the on these colorful characters slash you know crazy characters and and then and the ex, uh, husband that went disappearing all these different things oh yes and, i had heard about that yeah yeah right. yeah, <laughs> yeah yeah and uh and instead of these poor cats who who were you know just in, in horrendous conditions. So unfortunately, it did be, it be, it became a huge hit. But in my opinion, I just kind of missed the mark on on what it could have done for uh, for big cats, just like Blackfish, you know, did. Yeah, I've actually heard that. What you're saying is something I've heard because Blackfish was simply outstanding. You know, arguably one of the best documentaries that have really. That's have have really gone on to help other animals. Yeah. So yeah, that was yeah. that was a great one. Unfortunate, but you know, I think obviously you didn't watch the documentary, you didn't know, but there's a weird disconnect where I think a lot of people and and the same people on the show, it was the same thing where they really quote unquote love their animals, their cats and the other animals they have, and I think a lot of people feel the same. They love animals. They they don't want to contribute to animal suffering, especially cats and dogs. But for some reason, they, you know, they're still blind to actual suffering that's caused by eating a steak or buying a dog from a puppy mill or buying a fur coat or keeping a big cat in this little cage for his Mm -hmm. whole existence. So where do you think that 
disconnect comes from? Part of it comes because people just don't know the details. Part of it comes because it's a way to resolve, you know, their cognitive dissonance. You know, they love their dogs, but they eat their cows. They get really offended with dog and cat markets in China, where I've done a lot of work, or other places in the East. And people used to say to me, how could you go to China? They eat cats and dogs. And I would say, well, I just left the U.S. where they eat pigs and cows. And it would get a bit quiet. So part of it is just conveniently ignoring the reality and trying to resolve the dissonance in less than less than ad- adequate or um, credible ways. That that's the way I look at it. So, you know, in a sense, that's why that's why I do what I do by writing a lot for the, you know, writing a lot of popular articles about the cognitive, intellectual lives of animals, how smart they are, how clever they are, their emotional lives, and then their moral lives, where. A lot of them have a pretty good moral compass and in many ways far surpassing that of many humans. Can you give us some um, facts on on puppy mills? I think a lot of people don't really understand why they're actually bad or dogs. And, you know, people love dogs. They go by and they're all this cute little, you know, Labrador or whatever it is, as opposed to going to, to the shelter and, you know, adopting a dog. Right. There's enough dogs to go around at shelters, so that's where I send people. And people go, well, I really want this kind of dog. And you might not be able to get your first choice, but you could definitely find a dog who you would like to spend, you know, the rest of, you know, you'd like to have for as long as they live if you outlive them. But puppy mills are breeding mills. You know, they breed females until they can't make any more babies. And then they either dump them or sell them or kill them. And people don't realize that. They just breed them till they breed them to death. The conditions that most of them, if not all of them, are horrific. They're filthy. They you know, jam a lot of dogs into a cage and then pull one out when you want to breed. They're <laughs> I can't I can't say any more because they're just they're the worst. And it's a well kept secret of the people who think that they have breeding rights, you know, that They have a right to breed these animals because dogs and cats. There's also kitten factories and cat factories that people don't know about. And so they're just deplorable. And that's why a lot of states have legislation, you know, closing them down and not allowing pet shops to carry these animals. I think California is kind of on the forefront. I think you're, if I'm not mistaken, I think you're not allowed to buy dogs from from pet stores and from breeders, I think you're only allowed to adopt. I don't know if it's LA or, or the whole state, but I remember I saw something come out of there. Yeah, you're right. It's hard to shut down breeders because number one, there's a lot of money in them, you know, in breeding dogs. And it, that would be hard to shut down. But to me, closing down puppy mills is what I call the low hanging fruit. It's like, you know, this is not, this is a no brainer, if you will. Can only hope that, you know, as in the future that, you know, we see puppy mills being closed down nationally and hopefully globally. They need a they need a documentary like Blackfish for puppy mills. Maybe that'll get people. They really do. It would be horrifically difficult to watch. But something like Blackfish would really be very effective because it's it's a really well kept secret, if you will. Every time they. They show a uh, something about dogs in China. I always have such a hard time watching it, and I'm just, I can't watch. It. I'm not going to be able to sleep at night if I watch this whole horrific video. So mm-hmm. I just I used to watch back in the day all these videos because I was like, you know, that that was kind of like in a time where I was still developing my own outlook on these different topics. Mm-hmm. Uh, but after a while, I was like, okay, I, I think I have the the, the 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 gist, the majority of it. <laughs> And I just, I don't want to put myself through watching some of these horrific videos anymore. Nope. I don't watch that stuff anymore. That's why I didn't want to watch Tiger King and people send me horrific videos. I just don't watch them. I mean, people, yeah. I mean, given what's happening with this pandemic, but just what's happening in the world in general, really, people need positive messages. And you could put out positive messages and still have people be concerned about the mistreatment of other animals. So in conservation, it's very, you know, instead of showing, you know, slaughtered, butchered elephants with no tusks, 
show an elephant mother with her baby and people who want to stop the dairy industry instead of showing the horrific pictures of dairy cows, show a mother cow with her baby and then explain how the baby is, you know, basically kidnapped from the mother. So um, we don't need, I, I mean, that's my feeling. Some people disagree with me, but most of the people I know have seen their share of horrific uh, videos of violent abuse towards non-humans and they don't need to see it anymore. So I would like to see a little more positivity, especially in times like this. I definitely agree with that. You know, talking about that subject, how different would human life be without dogs? Like dogs that, as we know them right now, how different do you think our life would be if we didn't, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago, meet a wolf and kind of make it into what the dog is today? Well. A large percentage of homes in the U.S. and, you know, certain parts of the world have dogs and cats, of course, as their companions. So I think their lives would, you know, the people's lives would really differ without them. I mean, we've kind of co-evolved a whole lot of different traits, you know, as do I'll focus on dogs, but, you know, as dogs became dogs. And dogs do a lot for us. I mean, not for everyone. You know, people say dogs are our best friends. No, they're not our best friends. Dog abuse is on the rise and it's really rampant. Um, so not all dogs like us. And when they say, you know, dogs are unconditional lovers, no, they, that's just not so. So if you've ever rescued a dog or been around a dog who's been abused, they're very selective in terms of the humans with whom they choose to interact. So they're not our best friends and they are not unconditional lovers. Do they have the potential to be really social and, you know, love us, if you will, and form strong bonds? Yes, of course they do. But that can be overridden by merely by the way in which they're treated when they're, they're very young. You know, once again, to us, the real question is, is what the world will be like for dogs when we're gone. <laughs> and that's what we were talking about before, that there's a lot of speculations. So it's really difficult to come up with any solid Answers, will they form packs like some dogs do now? Yeah, they will form packs. Will females go to breeding once a year instead of twice a year like dogs now breed twice a year and wolves pretty much once a year? Well, we really don't know. And so it's really, it's a work in progress and <laughs> we can only make better or worse guesses. But once again, the big question people come back to or the big answer people give is they'll never make it or they'll always make it. And neither is true. But like I said before, since, you know, of the billion or so dogs in the world, maybe 15 to 25 percent are actually homed dogs. There's at least 750 million dogs who are already accustomed to doing things on their own, pretty much. Do you think uh, Chernobyl is a case study for what would happen if if humans disappear, I mean, you're seeing in, in Chernobyl, you know, animals coming out of their habitats and, and animals that, you know, haven't been there in years. All of a sudden, that whole area is just a haven for animals and fauna, flora, everything's kind of thriving. I don't know, like, what the radiation situation is, but definitely a lot of videos of, of animals in that area where before there wasn't. Yeah, Chernobyl is a good little thought experiment, indeed, you know, because a lot of animals have come back and the dogs around Chernobyl are doing pretty well. They're getting food from some humans who live there, like guards and other people who are working there. So, you know, the ultimate situation is going to be dogs on their own are going to have to, they will become wildlife and they're going to have to hunt, get food, defend food, find territories and home ranges, defend them, court, mate, make babies and raise them. And so it's going to be a brand new life. For dogs, um, you know, and first generation dogs who who are here when we leave, you know, if they've been homed and pampered, will probably be a, a disadvantage when compared to free ranging dogs. But once again, it's all going to come down to the individual dog. So I've lived with dogs who wouldn't make it probably for a day on their own, but most of the dogs I've lived with would really do pretty well because they had high degree of independence living in the mountains. And although we, you know, provided them with food and shelter and a place to sleep and veterinary care, they still were more independent than your typical Western home dog. 
what's your hypothesis? Which dogs are more likely or which breeds are more likely to survive when we all disappear <laughs> one day? Yeah, that, that was what I was saying before. I don't think we can say that. Because you could argue that small dogs like dachshunds might survive because they won't be viewed as, as potential prey. They don't need a lot of food and they can burrow and get, you know, get away from animals who might eat them. Larger dogs might become competitors for wolves and other you know, carnivorous predators like mountain lions and wolves, and tigers and foxes. So no, you, we can't. And some animals do better in cold, colder climates, some in warmer climates. So that's what's fascinating because as a biologist who you know, spent a lot of time studying coyotes and wolves and dogs, um, we don't come up with anything hard and fast. Because it's going to <laughs> depend on the availability of food, water, mates, competitors, you know, animals with whom they, the dogs can compete or cooperate or just simply coexist, for example. That's what makes this book, or writing the book, so fascinating and so interesting is that the minute you think you've got something knocked, you realize you don't because, you know, dogs are going to lose veterinary care. They're going to lose shelter and they're going to lose food and they're going to. But on the other hand, they're going to have more agency, we say, or more freedom, and they'll be able to choose when and with whom to breed, for example. But we don't really know whether, we, you know, we don't really know whether, especially dog mothers will be good mothers because, you know, the typical case is that their pups are taken away. But once again, if you look at data from free-ranging dogs, dog mothers can be really good mothers. And there's good evidence of paternal care by males in these free-ranging groups or packs. So it's an interesting thought experiment, but it's hard to come up and say, these dogs will make it and these dogs won't. The dogs who likely won't make it because there'll be no more human care and human selection is, you know, snub, um, smushed-nosed dogs because some of them can't breathe on their own. And some of them can't mate or give birth on their own. So clearly, if you can't breathe, can't mate and give birth, you're not going to survive. So those dogs will definitely, they'll disappear very fast. Yeah, I, I have two dogs and um, one of them, <laughs> I think if we would be gone, I think one of them would not survive. Uh -huh. for, she would probably survive for two, three days, and but that's about it. And my other dog... I feel like he's more independent. He has, he's just a stronger, like emotionally, he's a stronger dog. I think he could survive. He could, he could take over Connecticut. I feel like he could be the top dog in Connecticut if, <laughs> if he wanted to. Hopefully we'll never, we'll never know. Yeah. And at some point, you know, if we disappear, you know, the, the intriguing thing is if we disappear slowly, there'll be humans around to record the data for humans who are still around. But you're right. We won't know. But, you know, based on what we know in the biology and ecology and cognitive and emotional lives of dogs, we can, I mean, we can make some good guesses. Like I said, you know, you know, dogs who can't breathe or breed or give birth on their own or, you know, require cesareans or, um, you know, have other dis disabilities, if you will, both from breeding or maybe they get injured, will not get the veterinary care that they require. They're not going to get regular food. They're not going to get supplements. So in, in a sense, as dogs become, you know, wild animals, they'll be subjected to the same laws of natural selection as wolves and foxes and elephants and monkeys and chimpanzees and other animals. So that's going to be really interesting to see how they can do when they're on their own, having to fend for themselves. You know, will 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 packs be formed of mixed sized dogs? which would likely be better off than packs formed of all large or all small dogs, for example, because then they could share food and it would reduce competition between, say, the smaller and the larger dogs. Maybe they'll work better together. For some reason, I thought, oh, all, like breeds would stick within themselves. I never even thought of, of the mixing option. It's interesting. What you're pointing out is a great, is a, is a really important point. We, we don't know, you know, will breeds prefer one another if they, if they come across one another? We don't know who they'll meet, if you will, at courting and mating time. But you're right. Will they show a preference 
there's people who feel they do now, maybe based on odor, but we really don't know how dogs on their own, we call them post-human dogs, how they'll mate, who they'll prefer, who they'll seek out. But my feeling over time is that it's, there's going to be a lot more mutts. And since, you know, since hybrids have hybrid vigor in biology, we call it heterosis, and um, they seem to be healthier and more robust and more resilient, then, you know, one prediction would be that down the line, you're going to have pretty much much. But there'll be a size difference, you know, because, you, you know, a Chihuahua and a Great Dane are going to find it hard to mate regardless of who the male or the female is. Um, <laughs> and, then, yeah. and, and, and then, you know, you get to a situation how closely matched in shape and temperament and personality do these dogs have to be to form bonds. So it's just, it's a wonderful thought experiment. I mean, Jessica and I, in a non-self-serving way, we know a lot about dogs. And every time we come up with something, you know, and go, well, it'll be this, we can think of counterexamples, except for the ones, like I said, where the dogs just won't be able to survive on their own for one reason or another. Like if they get sick, they get rabies, they get distemper. But those are the, as we say in biology, those are the selective forces to which, are, you know, non-humans are faced every day. Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. That's, that gave me a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, food for thought. So yeah, so I just wanted I wanted to talk about your book a little bit. I uh, I actually read it last week, uh, The Emotional Lives of Animals, and I just want to add, you know talk about that a little bit. Can you explain the difference between primary and secondary emotions? I thought that was a interesting part. Well, primary emotions are those that people think are more hardwired, like fear, anger, different forms of stresses. They're expressed in certain situations, um, and they, they're simple because, you know, people think they're hardwired. The more complex or secondary emotions might be like uh, joy, love, embarrassment, jealousy. I, I find it hard to differentiate sometimes among them, um, but th that, that's basically the difference that, you know, they, some just seem to be very basic and have survival skills, whereas others a kind of icing on the cake. They can influence the way a dog behaves in a certain situation or is influenced by certain things, but they're more quote complex. The other thing, of course, is that for years, people didn't hesitate to write about what they call the basic emotions and the negative emotions like fear and anger. But every time you talked about a positive emotion like joy or happiness or grief, if you will, or sadness, people balked but there's no reason to and the tide is really changing in the book you reference you mentioned humanocentrism where we're where we are the standard to against which other animals should be compared and that was found it a little weird that we judge animals based on our laws and our understanding of things and it never seemed to take into account their own emotional and intelligent world you know is there a way where we move out of this worldview where it's just us and everything goes and, and filters through us? Well, I would hope so. There's a lot of resistance to that because a lot of humans are really good at making these pyramids where we wind up on top, of course. So we become, you know, the standard or the template against, um, you know, which other animals are judged. But that's changing, you know. Members of all species, individuals of all species, are unique and exceptional. And there's things that they can do that we can't and vice versa. So I always just say that animals need to be able to do what they, they need to be able to do what they need to be able to do to be card carrying members of their species. And so it's not a matter of a lower or a higher animal or a better or a worse or dumber or smarter animal. It's just how well do they do the things they need to do to be a dog or a cat or a mountain lion or an elephant or a goldfish or a robin, for example. And, and you look at it as an adaptive type of situation where they're smart enough, they've got emotional lives, and they are able to adapt to the situations at hand. And that's what I think is, is really important. But, but really, the, the current trend now is nobody I know doubts whether dogs, you know, we can say dogs, but a lot of other animals have rich emotional lives, including fishes. And research on fishes shows that, you know, they 
they respond to um, morphine in the same way that humans respond to morphine for pain release relief. They're good parents. They have great memories, and they're emotional. So, if we keep the door open to future research, I think the differentiation between um, primary and secondary emotions is going to be blurred quite a bit. Because a lot of people dismiss animals based on they think they don't go through the full uh, spectrum of, of emotional intelligence, right? They're, or they're not sentient, or there's no one there there when, when you're talking. You know, when I look in my dog's eyes. It's clear this, that someone's home. He's connecting yeah. with me. He's understanding what I'm what I'm talking. And even though I'm talking to him in a completely foreign language, he still understands the, the the tone of voice, and he has an ability to connect with me. You know, on an emotional level, obviously. And this isn't. I think humans think maybe this is unique to dogs. You know, maybe due to domestication or or the thousands and thousands of years that they've been by our side. But if we were to you know, if I were to have a cow now in my backyard and I'd sit with this cow all the time and I would nurture it from a young age, would would I have that same connection with the cow or is it unique to, you know, only to dogs and cats? That's a great question. You you would likely develop the same sort of a relationship as people do with pigs and cows. And like I said, various birds like long living African gray parrots and fishes, for example. So. No, I think it's a matter of familiarity and it's a matter of being open to it, you know. So I would say that, you know, I don't know you, but somebody with your sensibilities would discover that the cow and a pig or like, I don't know, an alpaca or, <laughs> you know, a, a, a robin. They all have unique personalities and unique temperaments. So it's a matter of being familiar with them, you know. So, you know, I, I'm always concerned that. People love their dogs, and then they'll go ahead and allow laboratory mice and rats to be just abused beyond belief or have cows and pigs and other animals in these industrial animal farms. But if you ask them, well, would you do the same thing to your dog, or would you allow your dog to be treated this way? They'll go, oh, hell no. And then you go, well, but why would you then allow another animal you know, who obviously has the same, if you will, cognitive and emotional lives, you know, has the same brain power and the same emotions. Why would you allow them to be abused? And why wouldn't you try to stop it as if were your dog? And that's where they fumble around. And that gets back to where, you know, we were talking before about cognitive dissonance. Some people will go, oh, well, you know, they're my dog. Well, no, I don't know. They're all mammals. They all share the exact same neuroanatomy, neurochemistry, neurophysiology. So, you know, that that leads into another topic where I like to think of dogs as a gateway species for bridging the empathy gap. So how you feel about your dog or dogs in general will inform how you feel about cows and pigs and chickens and food animals and lab animals. And you'll display or, you know, the same empathy and compassion and respect for these other animals as you do for your companion animals. In your book, you mentioned the reason you decided that you'll never work in, in a lab that inflicts any pain or suffering on animals is due to the, this lab that you worked at and they made you kill a cat. And you said that that was a real turning point for you. Do you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. And I didn't kill the, I mean, it wound up, you know, I wouldn't do it, but um, yeah, I was, in an MD, PhD, I guess it would be a PhD, MD program at a medical school. And part of the research was to look at how cats processed visual information. I don't want to give too many details because I, I don't yeah. feel like identifying them. But anyway, yeah, part of it was you train cats to run a maze and do certain visual discriminations. And then part of their brain was removed either in one operation or the same amount of brain material was removed in two operations to see if which was the best procedure f so that they didn't lose a skill they had developed. Um, and, yeah, I didn't partake in much of it at all. And then I was there one day when they were going to euthanize, but basically kill this cat, who I named Speedo. You know, you don't name lab animals. You give them numbers because that keeps yeah. them distant from you. But I had named uh, this cat Speedo because he was really smart and learned to run mazes really fast. 
happened really rapidly. And he just looked at me in the eye. I remember, I remember, and basically was asking me, why are you doing this? How can you allow this to happen? And I just left. I mean, that was literally it. So that's the story of Speedo because I didn't, yeah, I decided I didn't want to spend the rest of my life torturing animals, cutting through the chase. Yeah. You know, whenever, A, when I, when I read the book and I read that part, I thought that was uh, really powerful. And uh, I, I almost don't understand how other scientists, you know, you'll see these videos of, of these quote unquote, you know, normal people in, in, in a lab coat and they're just, what they're doing to the dogs, cats, monkeys, just oh, horrific yeah. things. And then going back to their house with three kids and a wife and just, it's like a normal day. And I just don't understand, again, that, that disconnect of how you can do that. I'll never get it. No, I'm glad you won't because I never have either, but it works for some people and whatever. That's what I have to say. I mean, you just, I feel you put out the information you make people, you, you don't make them, you ask them to think about what they're doing, and then they themselves are going to make their decisions. But right, I mean, you have people go in and torture dogs in the lab and then go home and their dog is their best friend. And I, I don't get it. And I'm glad I don't get it. But that is something that I think when we begin to understand what's happening there, perhaps we'll be able to get on top of it, you know, and, and at least call attention to the people that they're acting in a very bizarre way. But that's happening every day now with people who do horrific things to animals in the name of humans or in the name of science and then go home and love their dog or cat. Yeah, it's a little twisted. Do you think the fact that humans anthropomorphize animal behavior helps or hurts animals in the long run? Well, I think it helps. And I don't think it's a problem. And I think it helps in the end because despite what some people say, and there's a, re, there's a, there's far, far fewer people, if, if you will, in academics who are criticizing, quote, being anthropomorphic. It allows you access into their world. I mean, since we're all mammals, at least, you know, humans and dogs and cats and elephants and great apes and monkeys, you know, we all have the same nervous systems, basically the same neurochemicals, the same neural structures, the same you know, basically neural functioning. So it helps. And in fact, there was a recent study showing um, in a conservation context that when we talk about animals as being, not as if they're sentient, but as being sentient feeling beings, it actually makes people feel better about them and it has some positive conservation outcomes. I don't find this particularly surprising. So. We need to be careful. You know, I always say we can't, you know, we need to put the reins on the words we use, but there's nothing wrong with being anthropomorphic and using the same words we use to describe joy, you know, joy is dogs and humans and cats and birds, for example, because it's the same emotion. It might not be felt the same. So your joy and my joy and my grief and your grief might not be the same, but it doesn't mean that you have it and I don't, or vice versa. It simply means that we experience and ex we experience the emotion uh, differently and we express our feelings differently. So too do other animals. Because even sometimes humans, you know, if they'll um, process grief uh, in a way that doesn't seem like it's grief, you know, like if they're not crying, if they're not visibly sad, then sometimes people look at them and say... I don't think he's sad or I don't think he's really grieving or whatever the reason, but it, they're just processing it differently. And once when people do things differently, uh, I think for a lot of people, it just, it, it throws them, you know, takes them aback. They just don't know. They don't know how to process what the other person can process. It's a little weird, but um, no, it's an important point. I mean, I would imagine that, that you like to play. I imagine that the things that make me laugh, you know, a lot of them, maybe not all of them would make you laugh, but I'm wrong to think that, you know, it's a one-to-one -one relationship that what makes me sad will make you sad or vice versa. So that's what's phenomenally interesting is when you study dogs and other animals is to find these incredibly um, large variations within a species of 
not only how the animals feel certain things, but how they express those behaviors. And that's where future research is really going to concentrate. Why do you have these individual differences and how did they come about? So that Mark and Rory are so different, yet they're human males. Based on on scientific evidence, how do you actually decide which animal is sentient and, and which isn't? Yeah, the starting point is in terms of sentience and feeling, all animals are sentient and feeling to some degree. I mean, and I don't mean that in the kind of a dismissive way, but there are people who really have developed those arguments from, you know, single cells to complex organisms like humans, dogs, and great apes and elephants, for example. So I personally prefer not to make any taxonomic claims just because I really have a more inclusive view of sentience. But, um, you know, there are some people who go, well, you know, reptiles and amphibians aren't sentient. They don't have feelings. What we know that, or fishes too, say among the vertebrates, but we know that that's not true. So I always just keep the door open and, you know, there's a broad enough spectrum of animals um, who we know are sentient and, you know, focus on that. I mean, what's really interesting, the Federal Animal Welfare Act in the United States doesn't recognize mice and rats as animals. And people are incredulous. But if you read the act, it says we are redefining the word animal to exclude mice, rats, fishes, and other non-humans. So, th- you know, think about that. This is a federal act. This establishes regulations and protocols for how these animals can be treated. But a two-year-old probably, or at least a five-year-old, knows a rat is an animal. I've had some really interesting discussions with kids, and they're incredulous. So this gets back to how can people do the things they do. And one is that there's only a handful of scientists who actually have ever questioned this obvious misclassification of mice and rats, for example. Where are they? I always say, where have all the scientists gone? I mean, they know that this is a lie, that rats are not, rats and mice and other animals are in animals. So it just enables them to do what they want to do, some like to do, without having to deal overtly, if you will, with the dissonance they feel. They go, well, we're allowed to do it because it's part of the regulation. Oh, and my daughter has a pet rat who we all love. I mean, I've heard stories like that, and I'm thinking, oh, I'm not sure. I'm I'm glad you're not my close friend. (laughs) (laughs) Well, really, I mean, I think this is a completely perverted sense of values to, once again, like you said, you know, go home, love your dog, and then go in and torture a dog in a lab. It, it, It defies reality to me, but some people do it. But I do think it's a perverted point of view. I think we're on the right trajectory as humans. You know, we used to, humans used to own slaves and then they didn't give uh, women's rights. And then up till even a hundred years ago, you would have six-year-old boys working in the coal mine. Yep. And gradually we were given people rights and now everyone's, you know, pretty much across the world, everyone's pretty much equal, maybe except for a few countries. And gradually we're giving animals uh, more rights and we're treating them better. So I think gradually we will become better and hopefully we'll put all animals on the same uh, level playing field of uh, disrespect and leaving them the F alone. (laughs) I had this thought actually last night and it's something I wanted to uh, bring up with you. You know, you see, unfortunately in the wild, you've seen uh, less, you know, less animals due to uh, disappearing landscapes, climate change, human encroachment, poaching, hunting, all, all the, all the bad shit. And you're seeing more zoos, sanctuaries, backyard zoos, uh, which are, some are really bad. Some uh, I'm assuming are are decent, but people are living more with wild animals like those tigers and like monkeys and like all these other animals. Do you think there could be a point somewhere in the distant future? I'm talking thousands of years where a lot of these animals will be just as domesticated as, as dogs are today. I'm not sure to be honest with you because domestication is really, you know, human selection, artificial selection, 
that's really goal directed. In other words, it's not necessarily functional as natural selection would be, you know, select, you know, natural selection, selecting for traits that allow animals to survive and thrive and reproduce and produce viable offspring. So once again, you know, you get back to the breeding of French bulldogs, for example, or dogs who can't breathe, breed or give birth on their own. So if I'm reading you right, those animals won't survive. And wild animals, you know, today, you know, some wild animals have very high mortality rates, especially in the first year of life. So if you live long enough and you live 12 months, then, you know, you increase the likelihood you'll live to five or 10, you know, drastically if you make it past the first six months or a year. I'm not sure I'm answering your question. I, I meant more in the sense that, let's say we keep breeding, let's say we keep breeding tigers. This is an example of tiger. Okay. And we're breeding them for the next 10,000 years, right? Could it be that 10,000 years from now, human X in the year 12,000 something, the tiger basically will be the same as a dog in the sense that it will be this loving, even though it's a massive, you know, 400 pound animal or whatever the, the mm -hmm. weight of it is, it would be just as docile and just as loving and just as, you know, friendly. Or would some animals not be able to do that and dogs are unique and only dogs? You understand where I'm going with it? Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, if we control reproduction for certain traits, mm -hmm. some of which involve the formation of strong bonds with us, then it's possible. I mean, dogs became dogs from wolves because wolves are highly social. And, you know, there was certainly some selective breeding among early humans for if you will, the wolves in transition to dogs who were forming bonds and were able to hunt, you know, so a wolf goes out, hunts, crushes the prey, eats it. But at some point, the dogs in the uh, transition to be becoming the dogs who we know today would have had to hunt and carry the food back to the humans and maybe share it with them. So there would be certain traits that might, you know, endure, but I don't know. You know, some people feel that it was the initial sociality of the wolves that sort of predisposed them to form these relationships with humans. I mean, there's a theory out there about dumpster diving wolves and they, you know, they became friends with humans. There's absolutely no support for that at all. The, a man named, named Mark Durd, D-E-R-R, -R, wrote a book called How the Dog Became the Dog or How Dogs Became Dogs. And he's an expert on this. And it's very clear through the anthropological, social, if you will, sociological, anthropological, and ethological literature that dogs became dogs because they formed reciprocal cooperative relationships with humans. And we probably did some selective breeding for the, those individuals and they produced offspring. And from those offsprings, the ones that formed the closest relationships, we chose to breed. And stuff like that. So, yeah, if we could do that with other species, it's possible, but but we don't know. I mean, that's the only yeah. way. You know, you've got wild animals, but you know, for example, you have some wild animals you know, born in the wild and have been ill and have had to be taken into sanctuaries, and it's very clear that they form very close relationships with humans. So, if you then went on and bred them, what would it be like? We don't know. I frankly think I'd rather not know because I'd rather think that if these animals come in and we help to rehabilitate them, that we reintroduce them to the wild as soon as we can. So, yeah, no, that definitely, yeah, I think we should keep animals as, as wild as possible. Obviously, we're, uh, we're doing the opposite right now. Oh, yeah. We're, we're, we're all over the place. We, uh, we're a disaster. <laughs> I mean, it's not an anti-human sentiment. It's just that we are a disaster for the lives of just about every other species on the planet. Even, even you know, the animals who live in the dark, dark water, thirty-six thousand feet below the surface. You know, um, they may be the least affected by our presence. Yeah. But in terms of oh, aerial, aerial and terrestrial animals, and animals, you know, in the ocean, think of. What's happening to whales and dolphins and sharks, you know, these days, wherever we go, 
and I'm using it generically because, of course, there's people who are not doing this kind of harm and killing. But basically, wherever humans go, non-human animals should be on the lookout. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure even the, 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 the fish in the bottom of the ocean have some microplastics that are floating around them. So we, uh, we're on every, there's no animal that can escape us, unfortunately. Right. And plus, but if, you know, it's interesting to learn. I was watching one of the Planet Earth series a few weeks ago, and they had submergible submarine that can go 30, yeah, 35. Nice. And so that's great. But we are intruding into their territory and their homes. I mean, and as a field biologist, I uh, studied coyotes for years in the field. I've worked on penguins in Antarctica before Antarctica was open to tourism. You are affecting their lives. But there's ways to overcome it, to minimize it. So do I feel guilty for what I did? No, I really don't. You know, we had enough data to know that if we habituated the animals to our presence, they went around, you know, being, they ran around doing their species typical or normal things. But let's not fool ourselves. Our presence can have an effect. And the responsible field biologists go out. And they are very sure to minimize or to reduce the effect to as close to zero as possible. What, what would you say was your favorite animal to study in the field? Oh, I, I can't. I love, I love penguins in Antarctica. We did the Adelie penguins, and they're, fan, they're fascinating animals. They're really smart. They're really emotional. They, they do really cool things. And the nine, almost nine years of field work we did on coyotes in um the Grand Teton National Park right outside of Jackson Hole, Wyoming. I mean, every day until the end, we were learning something. They're really adaptable. They're clever. They're cunning. They're highly emotional. They're really smart. So I don't know. I did some work on birds at my house outside of Boulder in the mountains. And um, I don't really have a favorite animal. I'm fascinated by them all. I really am. Yeah. Or maybe not, maybe not the one you like the most, but maybe the one that surprised you the most one that you were you know you were expecting x and you came out of it and it kind of blew your mind well the penguins because you know they all look alike and they all seem superficially to behave alike and i'd never seen a wild penguin until i arrived in at the cape crozier penguin rookery on ross island in antarctica where there had been very very few humans over for and ever if you will and you get to see that these Look alike animals. First of all, they don't really look alike when you get to know them, but they have very unique temperaments and personalities. And so I can't say it blew my mind, but I remember going into the field and just spending, you know, 15, 16 hours just watching these animals and laughing at them. Sometimes they're just such clowns, but also realizing that they have very complex lives and they have very highly evolved social repertoires, including vocalizations. And there's funny ones, you know, who we would attribute, you know, and there's ones that have very, very um, unique personalities, bold ones, timid ones, shy ones, you know, obnoxious ones. I got attacked by a whole bunch of them. You know, they hardly came up to my knees. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so so that was a really, you know, it was a unique experience. Not many, not many people have ever seen, if no less spent, you know, a month in the field watching these animals. And coyotes are always surprising, but so too are wolves. I mean, and so too are dogs. I spend a lot of time <coughs> at dog parks and they all have their unique personalities. They're cunning. They're smart. They're intelligent. They're crafty. They're clever. Some are bold. Some are shy. Some are timid. And some are just plainly obnoxious, just like humans. Yeah, I think that's why all these BBC Earth documentaries, you know, whenever they come out, Everyone just loves them because it, it's such a rich world that we never get to see. So when, you know, you have these amazing photographers and then videographers that go around the world and they'll spend a month up in a tree <coughs> just to get, you know, two seconds of a monkey uh, in action. Oh, yeah. Uh, so we can see that, you know, that's I think that's amazing. And that's something that we should definitely see more. I think those documentaries kind of open uh, open people's hearts more to these animals. I. Definitely agree. And that that leads us to another topic because we're getting on in time. But, you know, I always say that, you know, there's enough good documentaries on TV and on the web that we don't really need zoos. And I know that's another topic, but 
maybe next time, maybe next time. I know you're a little short on time. So I'll just ask you the kind of the final question. So what does a utopian future look like between us and animals? How, how can we work together in a system that benefits everyone? Well, it would be based on mutual respect for who the animals are, including human animals. It'll be not like our dominating them, but it'll deal with more of a coexistence type of situation. It's going to take a radical change in who we are. You know, we're living in the Anthropocene that people call the age of humanity, but really the Anthropocene is the rage of inhumanity. I mean, we have done a job on the lives of just about every other animal. And it will also come from the fact, like this one health perspective that I've been writing about, that respect for humans, respect for non-humans, and respect for our shared environments go hand in hand. And when we finally get some balance in the way in which we treat other animals, including humans, and our shared environments, it'll be a win-win for all. I mean, it, it really will. I think that's going to be a ways down the pike. But I still think, I think it's doable, and I think it's going to be where we wind up maybe in, you know, if we're still around, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but if we're still around, that's where we will likely wind up in the future because there's, we can't keep living the way we do as, if you will, the dominant big-brained terrestrial mammal. It, it just is not going to work. And so what I'm hoping is, is that as people learn more and more about the cognitive, emotional lives of these, of non-human animals, will we will come to respect them more for who they are. And at some point, we'll realize that we can live in harmony with them if we allow them the freedom to be who they are. And if we stop intruding and trespassing into their homes, because so much of what they do quote, bad or negatively is because we've harassed them to the point where if we were harassed, we'd be, we'd be behaving in the same way. Awesome, Mark. Thanks so much. I really appreciate you taking the time out yeah. of your schedule, coming on the podcast, talking to us. I had a great time. Yeah. And I'm sure the, the listeners uh, will too. So yeah, where, where can people uh, find you on social media? Well, the only thing I have is a homepage so they could find me at my homepage, which is markbeckoff.com. I guess I you have a Twitter account, right? I have a Twitter account, but all I know how to do is post. I don't know how to cross tweet and do everything <laughs> else, <laughs> but I'm not on Facebook. That's, that's good. No, I mean, no, no, I, f I found you on Twitter and, and you post really good, insightful uh, tweets. So definitely make sure people to, to follow him on, uh, on Twitter. Yeah, no, I, I do. I, I have a, I have this group on animal cognition, animal emotions, and compassion to conservation. So I send out a lot there and I tweet it. And I really enjoy doing that. I, I love sharing the information that we're learning about other animals, all other animals, if you will, because it's through knowledge that we're going to come to understand and appreciate them for who they are, not what they are or what we want them to be. So those would be my final words. <laughs> <laughs> Cool, man. I really appreciate it. And uh, we'll be in touch. Sounds good. Thank you.